Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're in week five, and in this very first lecture, I'm going to be continuing some of the ideas from the last lecture about what makes chromatography peaks broad. I'm going to be teaching you something called the kinetic theory of chromatography, which gives us a little bit deeper understanding of the origin of peak widths, and it's going to be really important as we go through both liquid and gas chromatography and try to understand how do we make the right choices to do the be very best possible separation. So at the end of the day, in a chromatography experiment, you want to separate peaks of interest. Remember, what makes chromatography really special is that it's an analytical tool that lets us both separate components in a mixture and measure what they are as well as how much is there. But to do that, you need to pull apart the different features from different components in your mixture. And that's what we learned about last week. And so in these three examples, what you can see is poorly resolved peaks and then two examples where they're better resolved. And so they're kind of interesting examples. In this middle panel, what you did to make the resolution better was you actually changed the retention time of the peaks. And through that, you increased the resolution. In the bottom one, though, you did something different. You actually increased the efficiency of the separation. Or in other words, you made the peaks narrower by either increasing the number of plates in the column or decreasing the plate width. You basically made the resolution better by narrowing the peaks. So you can improve resolution by separating in time when things come out through perhaps changing the partition coefficients of the two analytes, or you can change the separation so the peaks get narrower. And what this lecture is gonna all be about, and in fact, most of the next few lectures, is how do you change the separation to make the narrowest peaks possible? One of the most powerful variables you have as a chromatographer is the flow rate. So when you're running a chromatography experiment, you're either pushing liquid or gas through a column and hoping that separation will occur. So you can either push it really fast, a really rapid rate, like a fire hose, or you can pull it really slow, like just a trickle out of a faucet. And controlling that rate is gonna have a lot to do with your resolution. So in these two examples here, you'll notice we're plotting as a function of flow rate, the speed of the separation, we're actually plotting the plate height. And just to remind you, to get really good narrow peaks, we want a small plate height. So if you have these notes, remember small is good in this case. So there's a couple of observations. First of all, we have to understand why is it that we have liquid chromatography has such a better plate height than gas? What is it about the nature of that separation that makes it intrinsically have narrower peaks per unit length of column? The other thing you'll notice is a really, really strong dependence on flow rate. So if you go too fast, you actually get broader peaks. And if you go too slow, you get broader peaks. But there's a minimum, an optimal flow rate in which you actually achieve a relatively low plate height or narrow peaks or good separation. So the purpose of what we're gonna talk about in this mini lecture is understanding why the plot of plate height versus flow rate has the shapes that it does. A little bit of just so it's in your mind when you look at these curves. So you can run chromatography columns extremely fast, and in, often you want to do that because part of how good a separation is, is does it happen quickly? That's part of an overall evaluation of a separation process. If you have to wait a day to get your data, it's not going to be as good as if you can get it in three minutes. So as you go to the right-hand side of this curve, really rapid flow rates, imagine the mobile phase moving through the column like a fire hose. It's just going really, really fast. And over on the left-hand side, you're just barely, barely trickling material through, and a separation might take a lot of time. So all things being equal, you're going to want to operate, of course, at higher flow rates. But you often don't want to have to sacrifice your plate height. So the question is, why does this graph have the shape it does, and how can we manipulate it so that we can go fast but still be at that minimum of plate height as a function of flow rate? So there's a famous equation called the Van Diemter equation, which I show you here. And that's what we'll be talking about today. The Van Diemter equation has, on the left side, the plate height, which is basically the y-axis of those graphs. And you'll notice that it does depend on flow rate, as shown on the right, but there are three different terms, one of which is independent of flow rate, and then two others which depend on that. And we're going to go through each of these one by one, because if you really understand this equation, it's going to help you design better and more efficient chromatography separation. Term A is called multiple pathways. 
It's going to be most critical in packed columns, so columns that don't have an open interior but are full of porous media. The second term is molecular diffusion. It's actually very much related to what I introduced last week when I showed you the diffusion equation. You don't have to use that equation, but I think you did hopefully remember that as a function of times, things spread out in a column. That's called molecular diffusion, and that's going to be the source of term B. Now, term C is a different one we haven't talked about yet, and that's called the mass transfer term. Let's go through these one by one. So A is really the term that's just independent of flow rate. It's telling you if everything is perfect about your separation, this is the very best you can do. So in this equation then, A is a constant, and it just is an offset that's kind of the very best case if you have the optimal flow rate, the lowest plate height you could achieve. So what causes this? There's really sort of three different origins of what's called the A term, or the sampling term. One origin is simply that when you inject the sample, if you inject 100 microliters, you're not going to get a perfectly narrow peak. That 100 microliters is going to take up some amount of time because the time you started to inject it and the time you finished, of course, is a delta T. And so that's one source. There's also a source of similar broadening in the detection. You have to take a certain amount of data for a certain amount of time and then turn it off. And so that's kind of a resolution issue, but both issues on injection and detection sort of give you an intrinsic width to both what you put into the column and how you detect what's coming out. And then the other part of the term A, which is usually the dominant term, is the fact that as things move through a column, they actually have a couple of choices for how to go, particularly if it's a packed column. Shown over here, you can see two different paths for the analyte, one which is kind of a straight path, which means it would come out early, and the other just sort of diffusion and randomly, it kind of took a more meandering path and it would come out later. And so that's often, often called the multiple paths broadening term, and all of these get convoluted together in term A. I'm going to just give you the functional form for the sampling term in terms of injection and detection, and I'm not going to derive it, I'll just tell you what you need to know. If you know something about the volume of your injection and the flow rate, then you can easily calculate the delta T that you had to have in order to get that material loaded onto the column. Once you do that, you divide it by 12 times the retention time of the analyte, and you can get a pretty good estimate of the plate height contribution that is from that particular term. And you do the same in the detection. So a quick example here, how you convert that information to delta T is pretty simple. You just take the volume, you divide it by the flow rate, which is volume per minutes, that gives you a delta T in terms of minutes, and you just divide by 12 times the retention time if you want those units in plate height. We won't often be doing that, but you should understand that if you want to minimize A, what could you do? Well, well, you could inject less volume into your feed. Term B is also going to be kind of familiar to you because we talked about this when we talked about the origins of broadening in chromatography columns last time. Diffusive broadening comes from the fact that as you put something into a column, just as shown here over, over to the left with the smoke, it diffuses. And so things want to diffuse in time. They don't want to stay packed into a very you know, narrow range of concentration in space and time. They're going to broaden with time, and that's diffusion. And how rapidly they do that depends on the diffusion constant of the molecules in the mobile phase. Shown down here is the contribution to the plate height from diffusive broadening. As you can see, I simply made some substitutions taken from week four, which convert the variance in a peak shape to the mobile phase diffusion of the analyte and the time that it's spent in the column. Once you convert that to the flow rate, realizing the time that's spent in the column is just the length of the column divided by its velocity of the, of the uh, mobile phase, you can derive this very simple formula, which tells you that the contribution to plate height from diffusion is going to be directly proportional to the diffusion of the analyte in the mobile phase. And it's going to be inversely dependent on flow rate. So what that means is if you want to have a small H number here, you need to have a small diffusion constant and actually a big flow rate. And that kind of makes sense. If you imagine over here to this left is smoke that's kind of coming out and diffusing. Well, it's going to diffuse less if it has less time to diffuse. So by running really, really fast, you give the band less time to move into the column, and you'll have a much narrower band. So when that u of x term is very large, because it's moving rapidly, then the 1 over u to the x is very tiny, and the plate height overall is small. So when you look at these equations, think through, how could I make h small, given what I'm looking at in terms of the physical relationships?
So in this case, what's going to matter, why don't you think through these questions, is diffusion into the mobile phase. You're going to want to run like a fire hose. You're going to want to run a separation really, really, really fast to minimize diffusive broadening. And another interesting thing you can do is if you lower the temperature or increase the mass of the mobile phase atoms, that's a common thing you do in gas chromatography, you can actually cut down on that diffusion mobility, the diffusion in the mobile phase. And that can also lead to a minimization of this term. But of course, the most powerful thing to do is to basically run the separation super, super, super. OK, this last term is a new one. So let me do my best to explain it to you. Back when I drew these pictures of the, of the concentration of an analyte moving through the column, what you're looking at is a concentration. And the top of the column here represents the concentration in the mobile phase. And what you see on top of the blue is the concentration in the stationary phase. So as an analyte moves through a column in time, there's a concentration above in the mobile phase and a concentration below in the stationary phase. And I told you that the mobile phase diffusion can't get ahead. That peak can't get ahead of the one in the bottom because they need to be in equilibration. They need to equilibrate, or you basically pay an incredibly high thermodynamic price. But what happens if that equilibration is really slow? So what if you're trying to move the column so fast that the mobile phase analyte doesn't have time to fully explore and equilibrate with the stationary phase. Well, what you see here is kind of what happens. It gets a little bit ahead of itself, but of course it can't have that sharp demarcation and concentration, so things do have to equilibrate. They just smear out and they equilibrate a little bit slow. And so I kind of think of this as the top example is you're walking your dog and your speed and the dog's speed is kind of together and you're equilibrated. And I think of the bottom case as the dog is getting way, way ahead of you and you're way behind, and so you take up net more space because a dog is basically going too fast. Or maybe if you're running and you have an old dog, you're going too fast. Hopefully you get the idea. In any case, what that means is the mass transfer between the mobile phase and the stationary phase doesn't happen. And when that occurs, you get a distribution of partition coefficients and you broaden your peak out. So the formula to describe this in terms of some of the fundamental parameters of the column really depends a lot on the geometry of the column. The one I'm showing you here is an approximation. And it's really only focused on the diffusion into the stationary phase. But you should realize diffusion in the mobile phase can be very important, particularly in gas chromatography. But for now, we're just going to stick with this simpler expression. What it shows you is that this term is going to depend on things like the flow rate. So in this case, you actually want the flow rate to be small. Because if it's small, if your dog is walking at your pace, you can keep up with it. But if the dog goes too fast, you can't. So mass transfer is always better for slow flow rates. It goes the opposite, right? And that's why it's linearly dependent. If, mu x, if ux is tiny, h is tiny, all other things being equal. You've got a couple of other constants here is the capacity factor. The two I really want to talk about are d, which is the thickness of the stationary phase, and d sub s, which is the diffusion. So the diffusion in the stationary phase makes sense. The more rapidly you diffuse, the bigger that number, and the smaller the h value. So you want rapid diffusion into the stationary phase to minimize mass transfer. Now the other part of this is the thickness of the stationary phase. The thinner the stationary phase, the more rapidly you can equilibrate because you don't have to explore. It's easier to get in and out of it, right? The diffusion doesn't have to go as far. So by running with extremely thin stationary phases, you're also going to minimize your mass transfer term. So let's practice with this, some conceptual questions. You can go pause now if you want, but I'm just going to go right ahead. So what diffusion constant matters to term C in the Van Diemter equation? Well, it's going to be mass transfer. And it's going to be the diffusion of the analyte into the stationary phase. And I'm going to put a little star there, because as you're going to see in a couple of lectures, in some cases it'll be both. But usually it's dominated by diffusion into the stationary phase. The next question, why does this term get worse for larger capacity factors? Well, that has to do with how much time it spends in the column. So remember, more time spent in the column is going to aggravate this problem. And finally, do you want a fire hose or do you want a trickle when you're running this? Well, you want to move really slowly because you want to have that analyte have plenty of time to equilibrate so it's not getting ahead of itself in the mobile phase and smearing out the concentration gradients within the column. So you want to trickle and to let it go slow. So hopefully, if you remember the prior slide, you see immediately the challenge. <laughs> If you want to make H really tiny, 
You have one term that's saying go really fast, go like a fire hose, and that's the diffusion into the mobile phase. And then you have another term that says if you want a really narrow peak, you better go really slow. So as you might have guessed, that's going to complicate things when you want to optimize. But I just want to sum up this mini lecture and sort of go over where we've been. We've talked about things like plate height and the number of equivalent plates as ways of measuring the efficiency of a column. Efficiency is another term for how narrow can the peaks be in a separation. We talked about the resolution between two peaks, how to calculate that, because the reason we want the peaks narrow is we're going to be able to resolve them better. And finally, I've now introduced the Van Diemter equation, which comes from the kinetic theory of chromatography, which lays a little bit deeper foundation about why one column would have a different plate height than another, or why one separation would. Maybe you're not running at the right flow rate. Your temperature is off. Your stationary phase is too thick. These are all parameters that you control when you design the chromatographic separation. So with that, I hope to see you next time, where we're going to be talking about some more examples of the Van Diemter equation.